What? I have the suspect for you that you asked for. I'm sorry, it's been it's been a long day. Oh, oh okay. So, Emily, who do you think it is? Obviously not the person that we convicted, to be honest with you. Well, it looks like there's more people than there was three days ago. Yeah, we've been having to cover a lot. How'd you find all these people? Witnesses, statements, hmm. alibis. Well, I still think that Bones did it, but um, we'll have to look into it more. Do you, uh, what do you think? I really think he didn't do it, 100%. So why do you think he didn't do it? Well, I think he didn't do it because of his alibi. Okay. So, the guy that was working at the bar that night at Rainbow's, which is where he commonly goes very often, he was explaining that McBride was allegedly removed from the bar, but as you go on throughout his statement, is explaining that um, he's normally pretty nice, pretty relaxed, he's not too crazy is what somebody who'd be doing this kind of thing that night specifically would be acting yeah. like. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, he said, like, he's explained that he's seen him many, many times over there. Uh, he'd be described as a very nice guy. He's very well liked by the staff and the other uh, patrons, I guess. Um, only there's a, been a couple occasions where he's been removed. As I already explained, uh, he said he remembers seeing him that night on the 8th, the day of the murder. Yeah. Um, it was Friday, and he came in smiling as usual, but also remembered an argument that took place right at 9. So, Bones missed the last call for free happy hour drinks and was upset because he was broke and he was yelling at the bartender for ignoring him. The bartender signaled for me to escort him out, so I did. By then, things had calmed down and Bones was on his way out, ready to leave on his own, he said something like, I'll just go get me some money and be back in an hour. As Bones left and me and JT talking about him over here, Wally, big dog. That guy? Yeah, him. Okay. Uh, uh, him and JT, the bartender, looked at each other and smiled. We expected him to go out to the front of the bar and panhandle like he had done in the past, but he didn't... He didn't. He walked out the door and kept walking. I figured he had some other way of finding some money. I haven't seen him since. Well, what about the... They found a ring in his hand. What was that about? That's what makes me think that he did the whole entire thing. Why would he have the ring in his hand? That, I'm not 100% sure on. But I do believe that it could have been planted on him. Well, yeah, that is true. I never thought about that. But what, but we have to figure out who did that. If If that was the case... Yes, but one thing at a time, we really need to figure out how to okay. prove him innocent. Because yeah. I really do not believe he did it. Because he was at the bar around the time of all this happening. Yeah. But he somehow has Ashcroft's ring. Yeah, that's that's another thing that we can touch on later. We might touch that on uh, the FBI guy when he gets here. 
You think so? Maybe, yeah, because okay. he could probably figure that out when he gets here. Yeah, so our main goal right now is to, like, for me at least, is to prove Bones innocent. Yeah. Because it does not make sense. Okay. So, going back to all of the information of everything, since day one, he's been constantly harking on and constantly saying he is innocent. At one point, you would think that his story would end up crumbling, too. Yeah. Right? Yeah, it makes sense. I mean... His alibi makes sense together with the story that he's saying. And, yeah. going back to the whole ring thing, Officer Kent found him with the ring at Grant Park. Yeah. He was at Rainbow's Bar before that. That's a pretty good distance away from each other. Yeah, he's a homeless man with mm. no vehicle. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. He left... Rambo's at nine. Mm -hmm. How do you think he could have gone there, got Ashcroft, and come back here and was magically asleep in that time? So, we have been working on this for 19 days and you're now figuring this out. Because this man's trial is in three to four days. And for all we know, we could be putting an innocent man in jail. And you mean to tell me that you're just now figuring this out? Well, I've, I'm in evidence. I look over all of this stuff over and over again, trying to find something new. And I have not found anything new in well over a week on all of the stuff that we have. But I've been looking over the entire case, and I think I found something. What's that? So, on some of the newspaper clippings, it's talking about the case and everything and how everything's going on and then we have everything about what's going on in town yeah right here temporary road closure it says the fire department's closing is closing the bridge because a power line fell down friday night the so night of the murder he couldn't have been over there he couldn't have gotten across there because it was closed off correct because it yeah. was closed uh around like Nine, I think it says. So that right yeah. there just proves that he didn't, he wouldn't have had enough time to get over there. Exactly, there was no time whatsoever because there was no car traffic and no actual pedestrian traffic whatsoever on yeah. that bridge. Because if you look, Rambo, he wouldn't have been able to get over Tooley's and come back over here. Yeah, because that part would have been closed off. Yes. Yeah. Okay, well then it's not him. We can rule him out. We need to look at everybody else that you uh, had on here. Um, so, or we need to look at them. Right. Uh, I know the next possible person would be her fiance. Yes. So we need to look at him. Yes, because he was the last person to see her before it happened. Yeah. Go and see if you can find more evidence and uh, we'll figure this out when you get back. All right. Okay. All right, thank you. You're welcome. I gotta go to the interview. Please state your name for the record. Christian Corey Peterson. 
How did you know Harmony Ashcroft, Christian? She's my fiance. We are supposed to get married tomorrow morning. I know this is difficult, but can you tell me about where you were when you learned about Harmony's death? I was in my house when the police came storming through the front door. There must have been 20 of them. I didn't really know what the heck was happening, to be honest. I thought it was some kind of joke until one of them tackled me and slammed my face against the floor. They thought I killed her. It wasn't me. Obviously, it wasn't me. What other leads do you have? I know two or three people you need to talk to. Let's back up a little. To the argument. Do I need to remind you? Yes. Uh, Harmony and I had a little disagreement over what happened to the presents for my parents. Was this a common thing? The two of you getting into fights? I, I wouldn't call it a fight. It, it was just a disagreement. That's all. You didn't answer the question. Was this a common thing? No. And I don't think. You don't have issues with your temper? No. I, I don't know. You ever hit Harmony? Never. For a guy with no anger issues, you seem pretty hot under the collar. My fiance is dead. I was supposed to get married tomorrow and, and now I'm, I'm sitting in this box with you. Why are you questioning me? We're wasting time. Y you think I'd just get in, in an argument with her in front of both of our families and then take her out back and kill her? So who did? Ratliff, the guy at the clinic, he's been stalking her. Why are you not grilling him like this? Interesting. Or maybe that psycho Navy guy who lost his kid. I don't know his name, but he blames Harmony for losing custody over his kid. He was a deadbeat, but I told her not to testify. It was too risky, but she didn't care. Had you ever met either of these guys? No. Harmony painted a pretty good picture for me. She talked about how the one guy was stalking her, calling the clinic, coming down, making threats. And the other guy with the son, he's a psychopath. He has PTSD or something probably. I can't believe I did that. I'm sorry? I should have done more to protect her. I knew the guy was stalking her, but <laughs> we just thought after a while, He'll run out of energy. I should have done more. I should have never let her stay there on her own like that. Especially knowing some creep was after her. I swear, she was like 50 feet from the door when I left. Were there footprints? Do you know where the killer came from? How would you describe your relationship to the victim? Excuse me? Would you describe it as healthy? Were you both happy? She was my everything. What I'm asking is... She was my everything. So there was no abuse. No control issues, huh? Uh, abuse? Are, are you listening to me? Are you crazy? I wouldn't hurt her for anything. It, as for control, I just wanted Harmony to be Harmony. That's all. I didn't need to control her. Sh she can't be controlled. I just wanted her to be who she was forever. I wanted us to grow old together. Till death do us part. Till what? Till death do we part. It's just that stupid thing we say to each other about the wedding, but... <laughs> but now... That will be all, Christian. We'll be in touch. If there's anything else you can think of that will help us... Don't keep it to yourself, okay? Hey, Chief. Got what you're asking for. Mrs. Webb, this is Agent Jacob Marks of the FBI. Hi. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you.
He finished at the top of his class, and he found the dead body of Brian Laundry in the Gabby Petito case. Huh. Yeah, that's me. Well, anyways, um, now that we're back on track here, catch me up to speed on what you got for Bones, McBride, whatever you want to call him. But apparently, from what I was told, he is now innocent, from what you're saying. So, who did what? Who's all on this case? Well, you already know who I am, but this is Emily Webb. She works in our evidence department, and surprisingly, she figured out that Bones is innocent. Yeah, uh, I just look over evidence a lot of the time, and couldn't really find anything on what we had, so I just decided to extend a little bit and look at what we had, and I found a whole bunch of stuff for it. So. Well, good job. Well, I mean, I'll say that's a first. <laughs> We're going to talk about your other detectives later. Anyways, good job. Um, do me a favor. Go back to evidence and give me the autopsy report, please. Yes. I'll get that for you. Okay. I like her. She's cool. Anyways, um... Alright, just catch me up today. Who are these people? So, this is Christian Peterson. He is uh, Harmony's soon-to-be husband, but of course not anymore. Uh, and we have Derek Sivers, who is suffers from PTSD, and his kid was going to see her for therapy. So, And she testified against him in court, so he's not too happy about that. Um, and then we have this lunatic, Rex Ryliff. He called her workplace a billion times because he thought that... Uh, that was his mom. Very weird individual. Oh. Yeah, and uh, that's pretty much it. I mean, got some pretty crazy people. Uh, I, th I, for, I for sure thought it might be him because, you know, it might be one of those cases where the husband kills the wife. I don't know. Um, at this point, I am clueless as to what could be going on in this case, but... You know, Rex could be a possibility, uh, for sure, since he's kind of crazy. And Rex, like, called her workplace, like, a dozen times, so I don't know if that means anything or not. But the Derek guy's kind of, uh, a, kind of a nut, too, because he has PTSD. But, you know, it's understandable through the stuff that he went through. Um, but I don't know what's wrong with his kid. Uh, probably, I guess, a lot of things. Oh, yeah, by the way, uh, Derek also has a domestic abuse charge on him, and he's a convicted felon, so that might go into play, maybe. But I still think it's Christian, the husband, so somewhat, uh, but obviously, you know, we gotta look into a lot more stuff like that. And, uh, I don't know, there's a lot of cards on the table, and there's a lot of people to choose from, you just gotta really think about it. Who's this? Um, that's, uh, one of these childhood friends, Jenny and Andy. Why? Who's Andy? Alright, I'm gonna for you, Chief. No tape this time. Give me everything you have on Andy Allen. Andy? Okay. Andy, I remember that there's a letter where I'm from Harmony's mom, and it mentioned Andy's name in it. Here. To whom it may concern, this is Deborah Ashcroft. The Riverdale Police would not give me your contact information, but they agreed to pass this letter along. I hope you can continue your efforts to help find the real killer. I was told by the police that you're looking into the old suspects in the case, and I think that's great. I, I want to believe that Christian is innocent, but I've always had my doubts. And there were a few other characters in Harmony's life back then that I've never felt good about. I heard you're also investigating Andy Allen, and I just wanted to respectfully say that I think the, your efforts might be better spent on other suspects. I've known Andy since he was six, and he'd never hurt Harmony. 
They've been inseparable since T-Ball in 2001. I included one of my favorite pictures from that team. Please let me know if I can help. Sincerely, Deborah Ashcroft. Um. You you mean to tell me you had this the entire time and you didn't even didn't even expect or put him down that you might be a possible suspect? Oh, he's just a friend of I thought it when you know, but. It was nothing, but I read the thing like a thousand times. I don't know. I mean, we've been working, as you know, we've been working on it for like 19 days. And I just kept seeing, coming across it and thinking, you know, it was really nothing. That they were just friends. And she said for herself that he didn't hurt anybody. So I just kind of figured. Okay, well, um... Going back to your original statement about Mr. Peterson, if you want to label somebody saying that it is the husband killer, why not label somebody else saying that it would be the friend that wanted to be with her? The, you could label somebody else. You can label this as the psychopath that wanted to, maybe he wanted to get with her. Maybe he was a stalker. You want to label him with being the PTSD guy that wants revenge. You can't label somebody in an investigation and not look at all the facts of maybe he's jealous. Maybe he's the jealous friend that wants to get with her, but Christian got to her first and maybe... Who knows? Maybe she never liked him in the first place like that. That could be a... You know? Well, hey, the mom is saying that they were inseparable. Nobody can get between them. Obviously, somebody did. I guess so, yeah. So, um, but you you can't, in an investigation like this, you can't write anybody off. Everybody could be a suspect. Any name that, any name that could be written down could be a suspect. Hey, um, it's Emily. I got the file you asked for, and, uh, we missed something. <laughs> So, it says, quote unquote, this is everything that he, give, he gave us, basically. This is his words. Um, he said that he was at home fixing the brakes on his car all evening, and then he went to bed around 11 p.m., but at 2 a.m. he received a phone call from Harmony's mom, Deborah, um, and she explained to him that Harmony was murdered at the party. Uh, his neighbor, Jason, uh, can confirm that he was fixing his car when the crime happened. Now, Jason, like I said, is his neighbor. And uh, he's been living on his block for a few months now. Um, he says that he can't say that he's gotten to know him real well. But he seems like a nice guy. Um, and then uh, we had uh, Chad Highsmith, uh, who was a co-worker of Harmony's. Um, but he's known Andy for about three years, and he's one of the nicest guys that he's ever met, and he's never seen him do anything violent and angry. So, um, what do we do now? Alright, so... Chad Ismith, Jason Great, Great, whatever his name is. Um, so, everybody's got a nice alibi for him. Everybody's saying that he's this great person, even her mother. So, we shouldn't be worried about him anymore, right? Right? No! Emily! Yes! 
Jacob, what are you talking about? <laughs> what am I going on about? I'm glad you asked. Anyways, Emily, I need you to please go downstairs and call Mr. Allen to get up here so I can interview him, please. Hey, yes, sir. Thank you, Sorry. Thank you. Bye, 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 bye. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Bye, 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 bye. Thanks. Okay, now that back to business. Let's talk about Mr. Jason Griggs and Mr. Chad Hansworth and her mom. Why does everybody keep saying how much of a great person he is? That's weird. That's weird. Don't. That's it. I don't like him. I don't like him. Nothing's lining up. Well, I mean, it is lining up, but it's not lining up, and I just I got a bad feeling. So, what am I going on about? Coffee. What is going on? Oh. All right. Hello. My name is Agent Jacob Marks with the FBI. Please state your name for the record. Andrew James Allen. You can call me Andy. How can I help with the case? What do you do for a living, Andy? I'm a paralegal at Wagner and Bennington Law Firm. How do you know the victim? We're friends. Best friends. Since we were six. She's like my sister. Okay. Do you recall where you met? How is this relevant? Look. I want to help, and I know you have to question everybody to be thorough, but come on. What does this have to do with anything? You're wasting time. You should be talking to Christian. He got in a big argument with Harmony in front of everybody and stormed out of the party with her right before she was- We're questioning a number of people, Andy. You happen to be one of them. Why? <laughs> Let's go back to the question I asked you earlier. This is crazy. I'm a friend, not a suspect. My best friend was murdered, and you have me locked up in this room? You're interrogating me. Andy, I understand you're agitated, but we have our reasons. But you have the murder already, don't you? What makes you so sure about that? Well, it sure as heck wasn't me. You have her jerk boyfriend, Christian, and the stalker guy Harmony was scared of. And then there's a homeless guy with a ring. You seem awfully familiar with all the details of this case, Andy. I watched the news and talked to just about everybody that was there in the past 48 hours. My best friend was murdered. I'm curious, does that make me a killer? No, but the way you're talking to me right now seems a little suspicious, don't you think? You're right. I'm sorry about that. I'm a little on edge. Know what I mean? <sighs> yes, I think I do, Mr. Allen. I know you're just doing your job. Sorry, I want to help. How can I help? You didn't attend the engagement party, did you, Andy? No. No, I didn't. Why not? I thought you were her best friend since sixth grade. Six years old. I was invited. I was planning to go, but had car trouble. What kind of car trouble? Brakes. They've been acting up for a while, and I had new ones ready to put on, but just hadn't gotten around to it. Then on my way home from work on Friday, I almost got in an accident, and I knew I couldn't go back on the road like that. So you were planning to go to the party, if it wasn't for your brakes? That's right. Were you planning to say anything to Miss Harmony in private at the party? What? Mr. Allen, are you in love with her? Where are you going with this? I'm just asking questions. What was your plan that evening? I told you. I planned to go to the party. To do what? To wish her well. She was my best friend. Did you have anything to tell her? You talked to Chad? Is that what this is about? Look, I do love Harmony. I admit it. I've loved her since we played Little League 20 years ago. It's no secret that I love her. Everyone knows that except for her, probably. But if that's a crime, you're going to have to lock me up, lock up half of the guys in our class at Riverdale High, too. So you were nowhere near Tully's that evening? Unfortunately. If I was there, I'm sure she'd be alive today. Wasn't this party kind of a big deal for Harmony? What do you mean? 
What do you mean, what do I mean? Rehearsal dinner, getting married. Seems like she'd really want her lifetime best friend there, don't you think? Sure. And yet you didn't go. Yeah, well, like I said, I had car trouble. And you couldn't find another way to get there? The car wasn't safe on the road, and I didn't want to ask for a ride. Uh, you could have took a cab, or a bus, something. You could have even walked. All right. You know what? I didn't really want to be there. I wanted to be there for her. But it hurt, you know? She's too good for him. So when my brakes didn't work, it was the excuse I needed to stay at home and get busy on something else. So you were fixing your car. All by yourself. Very convenient. Ask Jason. He's my neighbor across the street. I had to borrow a wrench from him to finish the job. He'll confirm it. Ask him. And you couldn't find a way to get the toys with so much to tell her. I loved her. Do you understand that? I would never want to hurt her. She didn't. She just didn't understand. Didn't understand what? She was making a huge mistake with that jerk. She can do so much better. Not anymore. I'm done talking here. And I'm done with you too, Andy. I have someone to take you on. Hello, can I help you? So, she was killed, she was killed around 9 o'clock, 8.45, 9.15-ish, correct? Yeah. Right. 9.15, 9 o'clock, 8.45-ish, right? Yeah, so, that's literally been everywhere, like, everywhere. All over the news. Everybody's alibis. Time of the party. Everywhere. Like, everything state, every document, every newscast, every newspaper article, everywhere. That date, not date, but time, you know, you know what I'm talking about, has been everywhere. Like, so, for an example, right here. Just an example the interview with Andy he kept on going on about and on about and about what time it was about being 8 15 9 o'clock yada 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 um, he kept referring back to mr. Jason Griggs the guy from over there uh, long-haired Thor looking dude asking for a wrench to help him with the brakes of his car so before the party, before the party. That's what he was harking on me about. Everything was before. But. Mr. Jason Griggs. Narrative. He didn't ask for that wrench or anything after that until after 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock because the dateline just ended. And he asked for a torque wrench. So, Mr. Andy Allen was lying. I told you. I don't trust him. I don't like his alibi. I don't even like his face. Something about him is off. So, what do you think? What are you saying? I mean, you might have to explain all that again, because I just went to Arby's and... They got some good sandwiches, but that's besides the point. Can, what did you just say? Andy. Mr. Allen. Lied! So, in simpler terms, Andy and everywhere else, date she, or time she was killed, 9.15, 9.30, Autopsy wrote for 9.30. Mr. Jason confirmed that Alan didn't ask for a wrench until 10 o'clock. Oh, okay. Uh, I hear you out. 
But uh, what are we going to do now? Derek, you mean what are we going to do? Well, I get that he lied, but I don't know what you're going to do. I mean, we can call him up in the morning and talk to him again. I don't know how much that's going to do. I mean, I don't have much jurisdiction to go up in his house and just handcuff the guy. I kind of need to go and get a warrant. Have you heard of one of those? I have to get one of those. And, you know, and then that's how we can get up in his house. Yeah. You don't got jurisdiction. But I do. Okay, Mr. Chief of Police, if you move out of my way, I'm going to have a word with Mr. L. I'll take it from here. Bye. I'm glad that was empty. Mr. Allen. Hello. Hello. Andy Allen, FBI. Mr. Allen, it's the FBI. Please come to the door. Mr. Allen, I know you're there. Please make yourself known and come to the door. Please and thank you. Mr. Allen. Hello. Andy Allen, stop! Stay right where you are. Put down the knife. Mr. Allen, put down the knife and stop walking. Stop. Mr. Allen, I will shoot. Stop moving. I will shoot. Andy, stop! Stop! My name is Andy Allen, and I killed Harmony Ashcroft on May 8th, 2021. It was a crime of passion, not premeditated. On the evening of May 8, 2021, I drove to Tolly's to attend Harmony and Christian Peterson's wedding rehearsal dinner. I intended to tell Harmony that I loved her and did not think that she would marry Christian. But when I arrived at the party, I didn't have the courage to go in. I didn't want to be around all those people celebrating the wedding and decided to wait to talk to Harmony by her Land Rover in the back parking lot. About 9.30 p.m., Christian and Harmony came out of the back door of Tolly's together. They were arguing, and I hid behind another vehicle since I wanted to talk to Harmony alone. Christian was really angry and screaming in Harmony's face. I was about to fight him when Christian got in the car and peeled off out of the parking lot alone. I thought it was the perfect opportunity to tell Harmony how I felt, so I walked up to her, and with every ounce of my courage I could muster, I shared my true feelings. It took me a minute or two, but I told her I'd fallen in love with her at six years old, playing t-ball together, and my feelings had only grown stronger through the years. I told her she could do much better than Christian, and that if she only gave me a chance, I could prove it. 
Harmony's reaction was not what I anticipated all those times I ran through the scenario in my mind. She said something like, Oh, Andy, you poor thing, and put her hand on my shoulder, but I took a step back. It was clear that her feelings for me were not the same as mine, and I was floored and embarrassed beyond belief. I had ran through the scenario so many times in my mind, and this wasn't ever a response I was expecting. She kept coming toward me, offering her pity and concern for my feelings, like I was one of her patients, and I just couldn't take it. I kept asking her to leave me alone, and she kept reaching out her hand as I kept backing away. She kept moving toward me, and I was just so crushed and embarrassed and confused, and the rush of my feelings alone with her pity caused me to snap. I just wanted her to give me some space and leave me alone, but I lost control and punched her in the face really hard with my left hand. I'm not sure where that came from. I've never been violent in my entire life. Harmony went down instantly, and I immediately got down to try to help her. She didn't have a pulse, and it was clear from the lifeless eyes on her badly crushed skull she was dead. As I stood above her in absolute shock, I noticed the engagement ring on her hand and thought about how Christian caused all this. In the heat of the moment, I decided to take his engagement ring, thinking that he didn't deserve to see it on her hand ever again. I hurried back in my car, but was too rattled to drive away. About 10 minutes after the police arrived, I realized I'd better get out of there and drive home taking the bridge near the River del Marino. About halfway home, I realized that I had to get rid of the engagement ring, so I stopped at Grant Park, where I saw Mr. McBride sleeping and put it in his hand. I didn't know Mr. McBride and didn't intend to frame him for the murder. I just thought in a few days he might try to pawn the ring and it'd get back to the police and send them on a wild goose chase looking for the wrong killer. I realized I didn't have an alibi as soon as I got home, so I went to my neighbor's house and pretended like I had been fixing my brakes on my car all evening, even though I had fixed them earlier that evening before leaving the party. I knew that police would be looking for a powerful left-handed person, and while filling out the person of interest form, I decided that I would pretend to be right-handed. I've been using my right hand since. I'm so sorry for what I've done to Harmony, Christian, their families, Mr. McBride, and everyone else who has been affected by my actions. I'm extra relieved to finally admit to what I did, and I hope it helps some. I'm not sure if my nightmare is finally over, or just beginning. <laughs>